Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Yes, it's the Skeptic Zone podcast, episode number 534, for the 13th of January 2019. Richard Saunders here with you, coming again, once again, from the Bay Area, San Francisco. I'm having an extended stay in the United States at the moment due to, um, well, pressing family reasons. Uh, We're working to make sure everything is as good as it can be at the moment. But what a pleasure it is to be in the uh, Bay Area, one of my favorite places in the world. Coming up on this week's show, and owing to the fact that uh, things are slightly uh, different at the moment for me personally, um, a little a little shorter this week than normal, I hope you understand. We're going to kick off with a report from Ken Harvey. Dr. Ken Harvey, one of our favorite people, who is known as a serial complainer. And this is all about his complaints to the government authorities about ear candling. Oh my goodness me. Ear candling. Forgive me while my brain goes on holiday. Ear candling is one of the most ridiculous forms of alternative medicine you have ever seen. And this report uh, is an overview written by Ken Harvey about his complaint to the TGA, the Therapeutics Goods Administration, about this absurd form of quackery. After that, a follow-up report from Michelle Franklin, our reporter in the Northern Territory. Now, last week you would have heard her report about emus. This week she follows that up with a report about cane toads. Cane toads are a huge problem in Australia, in the northern part of Australia, and there are um, calls for the cane toads to be... uh, to be controlled with a bounty situation or a bounty solution. What does Michelle Franklin think about this? Find out later on. Following that, and I'm delighted to say, following that, it's our new reporter, Trish Han. Uh, I've known Trish for some years now, and she's a marvel. She's just um, a wondrous person. She's professional. She has great knowledge, uh, medical knowledge. (laughs) I could wax lyrical about Trish Han. Her new segment is called Trish and Chips. (laughs) Oh, boy. Yes, let's have some Trish and Chips. And, uh, well, Trish has been a reporter on the Skeptic Zone before, but now it's official, folks. She's our new reporter. Um, I'm going to update the website soon. And she uh, jumps in, takes over, fills in for Maynard and I, because we both couldn't make Skeptics in the Pub in Sydney. And she asks the big question this week, Why are the public so cynical about climate change? Or are they? Find out with Trish Han with Trish and Chips. Then to round off the show, another report from the archives of the Skeptic magazine, the journal from Australian Skeptics, where we uh, look at an article written by Dr. Richard Gordon many years ago about quackery. So a bit of a mixed bag on this week's Skeptic Zone. But now it's time for me to run upstairs and have something I had today for the first time. Some people won't believe it. I had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Hmm. And it was pretty good. So I might have another one of those. Well, I enjoy that. I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. It's a pleasant afternoon here in Northern California, uh, near San Francisco. I'm sitting outside to read you a report from Dr. Ken Harvey. Now, Dr. Ken Harvey, you will remember, is a, well, he's somewhat of a legend in skeptical circles, of course, for his serial complaining. Now, this is a man who puts together well-thought-out, logical, methodical complaints about quack products, sends them to the government, 
And it's an invaluable tool that skeptics have, this complaining, you know, approaching the correct authorities. And this report comes to us from MedReach Proprietary Limited, medreach.com.au. Of course, there'll be a link in the show notes. It's by Dr. Ken Harvey. And it's the old favorite, one of the most bizarre and outrageous and obvious quackery devices, modalities I've ever come across, and that's ear candles, ear candling. And the first time I saw the, this uh, at a Mind Body Wallet festival in Sydney, I had to look twice. I simply could not believe what I was seeing, the stupidity of it. Although, and I do realize it's the wrong way to, to approach it, because uh, if you call it stupid, people get instantly offended, and they get their hackles up, and they dig their heels in, and all those other great, uh, the great imagery. Anyway, it's plainly ridiculous, I will say. And this report says, Ear candles, the outcome of the Therapeutics Goods Administration complaint. And for those who want to know, complaint is, uh, the number is AC5TMWIYHC slash 2018. And this is posted on the 6th of January by Ken Harvey. Ear candling is a widely promoted alternative medical practice that involves inserting and lighting a hollow candle in the ear canal. It sounds ridiculous already. <clears throat> we read on. It is claimed that ear candling creates a vacuum that removes wax and that it can also relieve earache, glue ear, tinnitus, sinus problems, chronic headache, migraine, sore throat, allergies, and many more conditions. In fact, ear candles and candling are ineffective and dangerous. They do not remove wax from the ear, and they have no effect, apart from acting as a placebo, on the numerous conditions they claim to treat. They have caused injury from burns, eardrum perforations, and secondary ear canal infections with temporary hearing loss. The Complaints Resolution Panel, CRP, upheld 20 complaints about misleading claims made for ear candles and referred more to the Therapeutics Goods Administration, or TGA, on the grounds that regulatory action was required. Friends of Science in Medicine, uh, now that's another fine outfit, of course, that we'd like to promote, Friends of Science in Medicine also raised this matter with the TGA. They have pointed out that other regulators, such as the US FDA and Health Canada, have provided public warnings, important alerts, seizures, injunctions, and warning letters about these matters. However, the TGA refused to act. Instead, the TGA advised the government to exclude ear candles from the therapeutics goods framework, thus abdicating their responsibilities in this regard and transferring the regulatory responsibilities to the ACCC. This disregarded the majority of public submissions about this proposal, including one from the ACCC that opposed this change. From 1 July 2018, the CRP was abolished, and the TGA became responsible for all complaints about the advertising of therapeutic goods. At this time, ear candles had not yet been added to the therapeutics goods, excluded goods. Order number one from 2011. On 24 July 2018, a portfolio of 104 complaints about the promotion of ear candles was submitted to the TGA. On 21 September 2018, the TGA finalized this complaint by stating that they had sent an educational letter to all the identified advertisers. Hmm. This also said that the outcome of this complaint would not be published on the advertising complaints outcomes. The reason given was that ear candles were expected to be excluded from the therapeutic goods regulatory framework before the end of 2018. On 1 October 2018, the TGA made a new determination under Section 7AA of the Therapeutics Goods Act 1989, excluding ear candles from the TGA's jurisdiction. These products are now the responsibility of the ACCC. This is quite a long and convoluted story. We read on. I have now assessed the impact of the TGA's, quote, 
educational letter, end quote. Almost six months after making my complaint, 51, or 49 percent, of the 104 advertiser websites were unchanged. 12, or 12 percent, have removed some claims, and 41, or 39 percent, have removed all the claims I allege breach the Therapeutics Goods Advertising Code. Maybe that's Ken Harvey now in that aeroplane flying above me. (laughs) We read on. Thus, 61 of the websites complained about continue to make misleading and deceptive claims which I allege brief both the Therapeutics Goods Advertising Code and Australian Consumer Law. The critique by Commissioner Haynes on the regulators of the financial services industry is equally applicable to the TGA and the ACCC. A failure to enforce the law undermines the authority of the regulator whose fundamental responsibility is to do just that. It also encourages others to break the law, leading to a race to the bottom. Further action is required. Given the TGA's abdication of their responsibilities, I have now written to the ACCC requesting that they publish a warning to consumers about misleading and deceptive therapeutics claims made about ear candles on their ScamWatch website. And as an aside, that's a good site to check out, folks, ScamWatch. And um, there is a link on this page to ScamWatch. We read on. I have also suggested they send this information to those organizations whose members are mainly responsible for these advertisements. In addition, the ACCC should consider pursuing an illustrative court case against a large company such as Chemist Warehouse, who continue to make misleading claims about ear candles despite having received the TGA's, quote, educational letter, end quote. And I note that uh, there's a comment on this page from Mal Vickers, a well-known uh, Victorian skeptic. And Mal says, U.S. website Quackwatch has some excellent information on ear candling. They state there are no known therapeutic benefits for ear candles and there are risks to consider. Hot dripping wax is an obvious burn risk. However, Quackwatch also mentions two instances of house fires linked to ear candles, one of which resulted in death. And you can read that for yourself. I'll add a link in this week's show notes. And while you're there, you can also read lots more uh, from Dr. Ken Harvey. Skeptic Zone listeners, do you live in or near Glasgow or are you planning to visit sometime? Then you're in luck because the Glasgow Skeptics have got your Monday nights sorted. We're committed to filling up every available Monday night with talks on science and skepticism. Past speakers include Eugenie Scott, Jerry Coyne, Michael Marshall, Nate Phelps, Tom and Cecil from Cognitive Dissonance, PZ Myers, Richard Wiseman, AC Grayling. Noah Heath and Eli from The Scathing Atheist, Simon Singh, Rebecca Watson, and a multitude of local academics and sceptics. There's literally nothing better you can do on a Monday night in Glasgow that doesn't involve taking your clothes off. So come join us. We've also got a vibrant online community. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and get involved with the discussion. Glasgow Sceptics. Self-help for your brain. Life is wild. With Michelle Franklin. Hi guys. I just wanted to do a quick follow-up from my last report about the emu war and all the bad decisions that happen when non-ecologists try to do ecology. 
Same thing goes for politicians. And recently, people following the news in Australia may have noticed a certain politician who has a history of speaking out against people who aren't from here. And now she's getting rather excited about her new plan to defend the country from animals that aren't from here. But she's not talking about funding research or introducing better management policy. It's much more fun than that. She wants to have a cane toad muster and put a 10 cent bounty on their heads. For those who aren't familiar, cane toads are a highly visible, fast breeding, invasive amphibian, and they're not considered to be attractive by most people. They're poisonous and they eat a lot and they're generally not good to have around. They were introduced deliberately about 80 years ago and they're spreading across the country and nothing so far seems to be able to stop them. But the reason I bring them up today is because this politician has announced that she wants to get rid of them, which is great. But instead of focusing on the real research and progress that's happening in this area, she just wants to go for the quick fix and pay people to go out there and get them. It's great that she's enthusiastic about helping the situation, but when people try to make changes to an animal population based on their complete lack of understanding, it's not only wrong, it's insulting. For time immemorial, scientists have been asking for funding to study various problems, but instead of contributing to the actual useful knowledge and advancements, some people think that they'll just bypass that process and just act on their own and use their own ideas instead. It's the Dunning-Kruger effect where people watch one documentary or read one story about a problem and they feel like they're an expert and that they can solve the problem with their own genius ideas. First of all, no you won't. Second of all, did you even Google it before speaking? Cane toad musters have been done before, repeatedly, on a very large scale and we didn't have to pay people to do it. They do it voluntarily all the time. I remember doing it as a kid and so does Richard Saunders. And I bet most Australians have been out there catching cane toads at some point in their past. People still do it today, and it doesn't work. For years, as the cane toad moved across the north of Australia, we had extremely well-funded community groups that had all the equipment and resources necessary, and they were going out in force to collect toads. And they weren't just picking them up from around their houses or out the front of the pub and dropping them into the council, which is what's been suggested in the media of late. They were taking four-wheel drives and ATVs and heading out into remote areas and targeting large-scale collection efforts on specific targets. And they collected a lot of toads. And guess what? They didn't catch them all. They didn't reduce the population by any significant amount. They didn't even slow down the invasion front. This has been studied extensively, and we have the evidence that shows that it just doesn't work. At best, these cane toad musters temporarily reduce the populations in small targeted areas, and they drum up a bit of enthusiasm in the community for volunteering and helping the environment. But it's an extremely high labour-intensive activity with minimal payoff. And the reason for these program fails, and the reason that nobody bothers to suggest cane toad bounties anymore is because that's not how cane toad biology works. Placing bounties on some animals has succeeded in the past, and with other animals, it's failed. It's really not as simple as just paying people to catch the animals that you don't want. There's a very fine line between a culling program and a conservation program, and paying people to collect and kill animals is also a well-known and well-used principle in conservation. It's called sustainable use. You make an animal financially valuable to the people who control its habitat, and those people will in turn conserve it because it's valuable. Crocodiles are the perfect example of this. Their eggs are valuable because farms buy them to make leather. Therefore, people who own land that's covered in crocodiles now value them and protect them rather than shooting them out and running cattle on their land instead. For other animals, bounties can be very successful. Take the thylacine, for example sometimes called the Tasmanian tiger, although it's not a tiger and it's not only from Tasmania. Thylacines breed slowly. They invest a lot of energy in each baby and when you put a bounty on their heads, they got wiped out. That's not what's going to happen with toads. When you walk around looking for toads to pick up, you pretty much find all males. They're brightly coloured, loud and they hop around out in the open. Females, on the other hand, are more reclusive. 
They mostly sit in the water where people don't tend to go and they don't make a sound. Now, the females are the ones that lay the eggs and it only takes one male to fertilize them all. But even if you could catch 95% of them, it wouldn't help. Cane toads are cannibals and they're also prolific breeders, which means that the population is self-limiting. Each female lays up to 30,000 eggs and those eggs compete with each other. Toad tadpoles will eat toad eggs and young adult toads will eat baby toads and each piece of habitat has a set carrying capacity for toads and their ability to breed is significantly higher than the carrying capacity for that habitat. So it doesn't matter if there are 50 females in the area or if there are two, the same number of babies will be recruited into the next generation. Yes, there are some situations where bounties work. Emus and thylacines are the good example of that. But the method of control for an animal depends so much on the biology of that animal and the ecology of the whole system. We have experts who are all too willing to help. And this is the thing that grates me the most about this situation. It's not difficult to find out, to know the in-depth biology of the cane toad versus the emu versus the crocodile versus the thylacine, and to know when a bounty would help the situation and when putting a value on them would actually increase the population. But I would expect that a person who claims to have the answer would at least look into it and find out what's been tried and ask a few experts what they think before making a dumbass suggestion that's never going to work. Oh, and also, if this particular politician is going to try to be an environmentalist all of a sudden, she'd go a long way to just accept that climate change is real and stop getting in the way of the people who are trying to do something about it. Greetings, listeners. It's me, Captain Disillusion. On my YouTube channel called Captain Disillusion, I, Captain Disillusion, analyze viral videos of the strange and unbelievable. I explain how interframe video compression, 3D motion tracking, and stock VFX elements prove that Justin Bieber is not a secret reptilian alien, that those videos of ghost cars are just unintentional optical illusions, and that lightning did not strike a few feet away from a girl on a beach as we saw in the news. I'm real fun at parties. My best friend is a lens flare. Eat a dimmer switch, disillusion. I do know other people. Sometimes they even show up in my videos. People like Skepticism's Grandpa, James Randi, Cirque du Soleil acrobat, Erica Linz, Weight Loss Enthusiast, Penn Gillette, and the actual Beekman from Beekman's World. I hope you'll check out my adventures, interact with me in a platonic way, and even consider becoming a patron of my work. You can do all that and more on YouTube or at CaptainDisillusion.com. Hmm, let's have some Trish and Chips. Here's Trish Han. So, I'm here at Sydney Skeptics in the Pub, standing in for Richard and or Maynard. And I'm going to be asking a question tonight, and that question is, why is there such cynicism towards climate change amongst the general public? Uh, let's see how things go with me taking over temporarily for tonight. So I'm here with the legendary Tim Mendham. I exist. <laughs> ah, I know. Um, so, Tim, what do you think of the question, uh, why are people so hesitant or cynical about climate change amongst the general public? Well, I think it's a mistaken question, actually, because I think most people are actually not cynical. From what I understand from the polls, etc., and certainly from talking to people, uh, let's go beyond sceptical circles, but, yeah, in general public, I think most people agree that there is an issue with climate change, with anthropogenic uh, global warming, etc., right, that people do accept that it's happening and they want something to be done, right? I mean, the fact that uh, there's a number of politicians and shop jocks and people like that who are making a loud noise, I think, beyond their numbers, basically. So I would say, while people might be confused, um, and certainly you get into the, you don't have to get very far into the scientific details to get confused. It's well beyond the, the ken of most people. But the, the thing to ask, ask farmers. Farmers, all of them, agree that this is happening and mm -hmm. that it's an issue. Because they're and seeing it, aren't they? They're seeing it, absolutely. They're seeing it over the last 20 years. 
and they're not known to be sort of uh, lefties, activists, etc. You've got so, a good point there. <laughs> but I think yeah, that, that's what I, you know, I see all the time. And I've seen some of the evidence, a lot of the evidence, a lot of the time, being on the front line, being legendary, that, um, that are people who approach me all the time but with their theories and with their criticisms, um, amongst the sceptics, the vast majority of sceptics accept that climate change is an issue, it's happening and something needs to be done. Vast majority. Um, but there are always a number of fairly loud people and people who claim scientific expertise, and some of them have it, right, who put forward theories and lists and, the, and criticise the supposed 97% of scientists or climatologists who accept that it's happening and say there are a lot of others who don't. Yes, one in particular, I got a list sent to me just recently and it's referred to many, many times in anti-climate change because we have 300 uh, very well-known, noted uh, scientists who will say it's rubbish and you go through the list, <clears throat> it's not hard to do, uh, you realise that most of them are not climatologists, in fact very few are climatologists, um, and that a lot of them don't have any qualifications or any listed uh, background or credentials of any sort, and amongst them is at least one creationist. Amazing. Who, run, who runs a creationist foundation. Even better. Uh, it just surprises me that this list is being quoted by people with a scientific bent, or even worse, a sceptical bent. Now, I'm sure there's a lot of genuine people out there who have concerns about the th climate change theory, uh, who object to it. Um, there's obviously a lot of political issues in there, a lot of uh, economic issues, a lot of economic uh, philosophy, um, and frankly, free market as opposed to interventionist sort of activities, that sort of thing. Climate change is a very interventionist Situation. A lot of people just object to that on principle. That's their that's their uh, option, of course. But at the same time, you can't. The science is not open to a political debate. Yeah, I completely agree. Thank you. Oh, and look who's just walking in. I believe that might be Jessica Singer on the horizon. It is I. Yes. So the tonight's question is: Why do you think there's a hesitancy or a cynicism around accepting climate change amongst the general public? Well, my counter question would be, is there? Mm. Is there? We're constantly being told there's a cynicism and nobody believes it, but the people who are telling us that are the rabid climate change deniers. So are they peddling their own agenda? Ah. Is it true? Drinking their own Kool-Aid? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. And, and would you like to answer that question? Um... Why is there cynicism? And what was the question again? As in, as in <laughs> are, are there? The question being, you know, are there? Are, is there a cynicism at all? So do you? Oh, look, I, th I certainly, I certainly think some people deny it. I have a colleague at work who is an avid denier, um, and I just have to walk away. Um, but. Most of the people I know, and I don't think it's just my own echo chamber, uh, most people I know think that, yes, anthrop anthropogenic climate change is happening. You know, I met my cousin who comes from Victoria and she grew up in the country for lunch today and she's driven up from Victoria to... Um, to Sydney through the bush mm. and she says it's changed mm. yeah things well, are so go. different and you know look at the Murray da well, look, look, look what's happening with the Murray Darling Basin look what's happening with the bushfire season look, look what the wine growers are saying about the temperature changes and how it's affecting the, the, the crops and the varieties that they can grow I mean there's all this um information and evidence out there pointing pointing that way absolutely all right jessica oh. shrugs <laughs> <laughs> so Lyndon, what are your thoughts on the subject well you can't trust anyone whose income depends on furthering a particular point of view you see okay we've got a pen up so who, who, are you, who are you mentioning there? Who, who's income? I mean, there's many people, many people, on many sides. On many sides. On many sides. So it's a hexagon? It's a hexagon of basically just scientists summoning funding from the warmth of the earth. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think that pretty much... Sorry, Richard, I have no idea what that was about. 
Okay, so I'm sitting with Gideon, uh, who is an epidemiologist, I understand. That's a fact, yeah. Fantastic. Um, and so what are your thoughts on tonight's question? I, my thoughts are that most people are hesitant to accept climate change because it is more convenient to not accept climate change. It is more expensive to, to go green and it is more difficult and we all like to believe things are easy even when they rarely are okay fair enough so kind of a libertarian angle sort of thing right yeah uh, li- libertarianism and just the general blindness we all have towards things that we don't want to hear okay excellent thank you very much so richard tonight's question should actually be why are skeptics in the pub goers so hesitant to talk to me when i hold a picture of you in front of their face and thrust my phone's microphone under their nose who am i talking to it's ben mcavoy here and so the question is why is the general public so hesitant to accept climate change because they can't believe it's got hotter (laughs) fair enough (laughs) This is Heidi Robertson from the Northern Rivers Vaccination Supporters. We are a group of concerned citizens dedicated to promoting good science and common sense in our region, the far north coast of New South Wales. This area, famous for its natural beauty and relaxed lifestyle, also has the lowest rates of vaccination in Australia. We are out to change that by challenging the myths and misinformation and by providing good evidence-based information to the community. We'd love for you, no matter where you are in the world, to join our fight. Please visit our webpage at www.nrvs.info. We also have a link there to our Facebook page. Tweet us at nrvaxsupporters, that's V-A-X, and check us out on Wikipedia by searching for Northern Rivers vaccination supporters. Thank you. From the pages of the Skeptic magazine, the journal from Australian Skeptics, this is a Winter 1988, or Volume 8, Number 2, turning to page 27 under the title of Alternative Medicine, Quackery, by Richard Gordon. The first charlatan was made when the first knave met the first fool. There are four interesting questions to pose concerning quackery. One, what is quackery? Two, why do quack remedies seem to work? Three, why do people go to quacks? Four, what is the harm in quackery? What is quackery? A quack is a person who deliberately misrepresents himself as possessing medical or other healing skills which he lacks. A quack remedy is one which is promised to offer a cure, although there is no scientific evidence for this claim. The term quack originally meant, quote, to prattle or brag, end quote. Quackery thrives in alternative medicine and is also present in orthodox medicine. In orthodox medicine, the cynical use of placebos is an example of quackery. Vitamins are a popular vehicle for quackery. While vitamins are necessary for good health, an excess dose does not, quote, stimulate, end quote, the system to greater heights, nor can an excess increase the sense of well-being. The reasoning that says, quote, if a little is good, then large amounts must be better, end quote, is clearly flawed, as food and alcohol so easily illustrate. Quacks often mix good advice with totally unfounded claims. Chiropractic is a good example of this mixture. On one hand, it uses spinal manipulation to treat muscular disorders, and on the other hand, 
It uses spinal manipulation to treat asthma. Why do quack remedies seem to work? The reasons for the apparent success of quack remedies are a. The patient's belief that the cure will work, often coupled with the financial commitment and a desire not to feel cheated. b. The power of the quack's personality. Many famous quacks were and are outstanding showmen. Many have paranoid delusional beliefs in their own powers, a case of the psychotic leading the neurotic. c. Spontaneous recovery, which characterizes most minor illnesses, many major illnesses, and a few very serious illnesses such as cancer. In the last case, spontaneous remission occurs rarely, probably in one in every 70,000 untreated cases. Most quacks add what is basically good advice on diet, exercise, etc. to their quack remedies. It is the good advice, if anything, that benefits the patient but it is often the quack remedy that carries the mystique and receives the credit. When a person feels better after using a quack remedy, the cure can have two explanations. Either the remedy exerts a real effect, or it exerts what is known as the placebo effect. If the effect is real, then it will be possible to reliably demonstrate this effect to unbiased observers. If the effect is a placebo, it can be explained by the patient's desire to believe in the cure. The word placebo is Latin meaning, I shall be pleasing. In certain conditions, such as arthritis and gastritis, over 50% of sufferers may report improvement when given quack remedies. The best placebos are substances such as vitamins or antibiotics, because people know that they can have genuine value in treating certain health problems. Every doctor will be familiar with the fact that many patients will report immediate improvement with antibiotic treatment, even though a real effect on the infection could not have occurred so quickly. It is obviously important to know whether a drug is exerting a real or placebo effect or a mixture of the two. This is why placebos are used in evaluation of new drugs. During the evaluation, one group of subjects is treated with a real drug and the other group is treated with a placebo, making sure that both types of drug look and taste the same. It is then usual to swap the real and placebo drugs for the second half of the evaluation. In this way, it is possible to make allowances for any placebo effect. Why do people go to quacks? Ill-defined symptoms, such as chronic tiredness, headaches, depression, and vague pains, are extremely common. They may result from worry, overwork, and poor relationships with others. People often hesitate to take such problems to doctors, but quacks can trade heavily on these, quote, trivial, end quote, complaints. Because these symptoms can be an expression of problems that are difficult to solve, it is much easier to focus on bogus diagnosis and follow mysterious cures than to face the real issues. When people do take ill-defined symptoms to doctors, they are understandably dissatisfied when the doctor merely excludes serious illnesses and reassures them that there is nothing serious to worry about. The patient still has the problem and may continue to look for an explanation and some relief. This narrow perspective called the quote medical model end quote of illness is an important failing of the medical profession. Quacks often trade on a display of caring which contrasts with the more detached behavior of some doctors. Patients who face a diagnosis of illness such as cancer or AIDS, which may be incurable and or terminal, can turn away from orthodox medicine in the desperate hope of a cure. Some people are attracted by the mystical approach, such as astrological diagnosis, hair analysis, iridology, or pyramid power. Laymen have difficulty in distinguishing between obtuse language in orthodox medicine and obtuse language in alternative medicine. What is the harm in quackery? 
Many alternative approaches seem harmless enough, but the dangers are a. The possibility of delaying diagnosis of serious disease b. The possibility of interfering with effective treatment c. The likely cost, both of the quack cure itself and the delayed treatment with orthodox cures d. The raising of false hopes, especially when an individual is in the process of coming to terms with a serious illness. E. The possibility that some quack cures are actually harmful. Laetril contains cyanide. Vitamins A and D can be toxic in high doses. It should not be forgotten that alternative medicine represents a multi-million dollar industry with interest groups ready to lobby for its expansion. The vitamin industry is a good example. Putting it all into perspective, the Laotril industry in the United States was estimated to be worth $2 billion in California alone in 1981, rivaling the heroin trade in that state. Little wonder that the modern-day knave pursues the modern-day fool with such enthusiasm. Dr. Richard Gordon is a family doctor and member of the Australian Skeptics National Committee. This article is a version of a talk delivered at the 4th Annual Skeptics Convention held in Sydney during April 1988. And it's worth noting that Dr. Richard Gordon went on to be uh, for some time president of uh, Australian Skeptics Inc. And this article once again can be found in the pages of The Skeptic Magazine, Volume 8, Number 2, and is available for you to view free online at skeptics.com.au. The Skeptic Magazine, the journal from Australian skeptics. Subscribe online to the world's second oldest skeptical magazine. Visit www.skeptics.com.au and click the publications link. You can also find there over 30 years of back issues free to download. The Skeptic, the magazine from Australian Skeptics. Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone. If my voice seems a little bit um, flaky, well, I guess I've just had a long day. Coming up next week, I hope to bring you reports from Portland, Oregon and Bend, Oregon. I'm flying up to visit my old friend Brian Dunning from The Skeptoid Podcast, and I intend, I hope, to uh, catch the show of Ono, Ross and Kerry who are appearing in Portland, Oregon next week. And I will certainly bring you a report from that event. A big thank you to Trish Han, who stepped in to cover Skeptics in the Pub. Thank you, Trish. Sincerely, I really appreciate that. And I'm thrilled to have you come aboard as a reporter on the Skeptic Zone. Thank you to those people who contribute with Patreon or PayPal. And to those people recently who have chipped in or come on board with Patreon, uh, I will be sending you your bag of goodies soon. Things are a little bit uh, strange for me at the moment. I'm uh, not in Australia. But as soon as I can iron that out, your goodies will be on the way. I miss being in Sydney, although I must admit, quite candidly, I must admit, I do not miss the heat and the humidity at this time of the year. I am enjoying the cooler weather. And wow, I'm going to cop some cooler weather next week in uh, in Oregon. But for this week, this is Richard Saunders signing off from the San Francisco Bay Area. You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Please visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for show notes, contacts, and to access the back catalog of episodes going back to 2008. You can follow the Skeptic Zone podcast on Twitter at Skeptic Zone, visit our Facebook page 
or leave a review on iTunes. You can also support The Skeptic Zone via Patreon or PayPal. The Skeptic Zone podcast is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed on The Skeptic Zone are not necessarily those of Australian skeptics or any other skeptical organisation. No matter where I record in the world, there are aircraft noises. <laughs> Amazing. I'm nowhere near an airport, I don't think. Good grief. I wonder where that's going. Maybe it's flying to Australia, who knows? Ah, Dice fans, I've not forgotten you. It's been a little while since we've played the dice game. Nevertheless, here it is, as I sit by a, a cosy fireside <laughs> with a gas fire. Looks real. Well, it is real. It's a real fire, but it's gas, not wood. <clears throat> I have with me a ten-sided die. I want you to use your psychic predicting power and uh, see if you can predict what numbers are going to come up. I'm going to roll it three times. Three times. Are you predicting? First number is four. The first number is four. Okay, predict again from one to ten. Here we go. Second number is eight. Four and eight. Four and eight. The last number coming up is, here we go, ten. There's a pattern there somewhere, folks. So this week's numbers are 4, 8, and 10. <laughs>